My name is Dorothy Brickman. I am the daughter of Eudis and Eudel Brickman, who were the first Jewish married couple to come to the island. I was born in 1916 on June 1st, and the first Jewish girl to be born on the island. With pride, I can say that I'm an islander through and through of the American Jewish faith. Our parents came here to the United States, to this golden land, and island citizenship and U.S. citizenship and patriotism were so important, and that truly, truly rubbed off on us as children. I remember the stories my father would tell as I would sit at his knee when I was a little girl. And he related what life was like for him in the Soviet Union. My father used to talk about the Cossacks on their horses who would come through the village, all villages, and burn them. And they were so cruel, particularly to the people of the Jewish faith. And my father, at 16, felt that he did not want to live his life there. And there was a farmer who took my father and his best friend in the village and hid them in a wagon with hay piled on top of them and took them to the border of Germany. Then my father and his friends somehow found their way to Malmö, Sweden and got jobs in a shoe factory. And then he married my mother who was his friend's sister. That whole generation, best American citizens this country ever had, they loved America. They came to America in 1913. It landed in New York, and uh, my mother was not happy living on the east side of New York with all the push carts and the rotten bananas and the confusion that there was and all, but they were in New York for two years, and it was a difficult time for my father. Now, what was interesting was there was a grapevine that went through the whole United States Somehow or other, everybody knew who was here in the United States and, in, and where they lived in this country through this grapevine. And my father discovered that he had a cousin, also by the name of Mr. Brickman, who lived in Boston. And Mr. Brickman had heard of a little business on Martha's Vineyard that was for sale. So my father and mother came with a baby carriage, and my sister, who was the oldest, came, and because my sister Rose was born in New York, and then I was born on the island. Our little community began with our six families. Mr. Kronig, in 1906, who came here and later with his brothers and my parents, the first Jewish married couple uh, who came here in 1913. And then there was Mr. Isaacson, my mother's brother, whom my father helped to come to America and his family. My father was an expert in making shoes, boots and shoes from scratch. He used to make them for the Cossacks. And when he came to the island um, and uh, he, uh, established himself in a little workshop, 
he started his career here trying to make shoes and boots from scratch for the island people, but he found that didn't work out. So then he turned to being a cobbler and from a cobbler almost immediately went into the shoe business and later clothing and uh, other things that were important for a so-called small department store for men. All right, there's my father and my mother. I always loved my mother's hairdo. She was always pushed up. And my wonderful sister, Ida, and my sister, Rose, and my brother. I was the youngest in the family. My sister Ida was busy from the time she was not only going to school, but when she was 10 years old, she was helping Papa run his business. My father, at first, could speak very little English, and Ida would help him and write out all the orders for the business, because Ida was the boss. She was the head, you know, in charge of us. That was a responsibility that was placed on the oldest in the family. Every Saturday morning, Ida would make a list. She wrote down what each of us was supposed to do in the store. And we knew that we had an obligation to work in the business. And, and as the business grew, we all took our places, of course. But in the early days, I remember maybe I was six or seven years old. My father put me in front of the register and taught me how to make change. When Ida was 22, shortly after her marriage, my father purchased Tilton's, Mrs. Tilton's little dry goods store um, for her and her husband and um, so that they could begin to make their own living. My father gave her the key and said, now my child, go make a living. It was expected of us absolutely expected that you are always going to be first and you're always going to do your best and my father said just go make a living we had a very traditional jewish home and so you didn't eat the meat that everybody ate uh, the the orthodox jewish people had the kosher foods and where the meat was uh, prepared in a certain kind of way. And my sister Ida and my sister Rose and I would take turns on a Thursday to write what we call the butcher order. So the, our kosher meat came from New Bedford and later Boston. It came by boat and train. And uh, when uh, the meat came, it was soaked for a certain period of time and then in, and salted. And then my mother would <clears throat> make little packages of it uh, during the winter when the winters were very, very cold. And my father on the back porch uh, uh, would had made shelves and it was like a deep freeze because our winters were very, very cold. And so that was where we had our frozen food my father was a leader. He said to me, my little girl, you make a list of all the Jewish families and give everybody a date. And I did. I made a little chart. And every Sunday, we would go to somebody's house. That was a ritual. You can still taste the egg salad sandwiches that Libby Kronig made. That was Sam Kronig's wife. And I can still see the, the mothers sitting on one side talking about their children, the house, and, and the welfare of their children, and the fathers getting together talking about their businesses and the welfare, and particularly about the education for their children. We would play cards or we would play games, but there was always a togetherness. I hearken back to the character and integrity of those original families who uh, gained such high respect 
by the people on the island because there had not been Jewish people here before and they didn't know what Jewish people were. They didn't know we were human beings like everybody's a human being. They didn't have a training course to understand the cultures. Today we have training courses to understand everything. We didn't have that in those days. And it had to be through the personal relationships that people learned what people of the Jewish faith were like through their business arrangements. With the Kronigs, uh, people got to know them through their grocery business. With my father, they got to know them through the Brickman's store and what have you. There were relationships, but they weren't personal social relationships. There was sort of an unwritten code that you didn't date out of your faith. At least that the girls did not date out of their faith. Eventually, barriers broke down to the point that, like today, there are many intermarriages and, uh, and uh, there's no discrimination on the island that I know of that has been reduced, you know, over the years. But when I was young, my father's mother, whom we call Bova, came to live with us, and it was very difficult for her to live in this culture. My grandmother typified the East European older person, typified an Eastern Europe grandmother. Uh, she had beautiful white soft hair, but in those days, the people of her generation that wore wigs and she had a brown wig and she'd walk down the street. Vineyard Haven, Martha's Vineyard was not for her. The children used to make fun of her as she walked down the street because she was dressed differently from everybody else. She always had a kerchief like a babushka around her hair around her head, and she had a long dress. I remember she went swimming down to Vineyard Haven Beach. She didn't know how to swim, but she went in the water and she made her hands go like this, and the children all laughed. I remember that. I was a Girl Scout. I recall that we had a special Girl Scout program at the town hall in Vineyard Haven and on the stage was a bed and I had a partner and we had to make the uh, bed the proper American way. The folding the corners and making the geometric design, I just, I had a hard time doing that. I just didn't know how to do that because in our home uh, we had the sheets that my mother had made, and we had the uh, feather puffs, that like a duvet, and we called them decas. Uh, and we had, um, uh, that's the way we made our bed. And I was so happy to have a partner uh, to work with because uh, up until 10 years old, I really hadn't been assimilated into the real American way of life. That was a great learning experience for me. Our Jewish observances were a priority. That was a great concern to our families that their children should be brought up in this new environment and new, literally, non-Jewish atmosphere, that they would have the strength of knowing that they were of the Jewish faith and could worship as such and carry on our culture and traditions. The High Holy Days were very important in, in our observance. And we had no uh, 
particular religious program here on the island because our center uh, certainly was established much later, Papa would close the store, we'd make a sign and put it into the, on the store door and say, you know, gone, closed for the holidays, for the Jewish holidays and when we'd be back. And uh, we'd go to New Bedford and later we would go to Boston and uh, we would observe the holidays there and then we would come home. We children did not go to school on our Jewish holidays. In our faith, in the Orthodox faith, you had to have 10 men in order to be able to have a legitimate service. Today, with Reform Judaism now, a new chapter of, in our faith, women are acceptable and women have a par. But in those early days, we had six families, so there were six men. When we had ten families, um, there was already growing toward ten families. A little community felt that it would be good if we had our own place of worship here. Uh, so that we wouldn't have to go off-island. And so they uh, bought a Torah, and uh, we used to meet in the living room at Sam Kronig's house across from the center now, and sometimes they'd meet in our living room. We would line up the chairs like in a theater. We would take all the chairs in the house, their house, and uh, or we'd get some additional chairs and we'd have our high holy day services here and as the little community grew um, it it was the hope and intent of the of our little community that we'd have our own place of uh, worship and uh, so that's how the Martha's Vineyard Hebrew Center uh, became uh, a reality Briefly, what happened was, where the center is now was a cow pasture owned by Bishop Whittemore of the um, Episcopal Church. Mr. Dean, who was the publisher of the first two volumes of the bank's history, he lived in this lovely white house, and he wanted to sell his house, so Henry Kronig bought the house, and then it was turned over to the, uh, our little Jewish community. And I can remember in those early days, houses were moved uh, with horse and wagon, and I think it was Harry Horton's big long wagon and his horse or horses that moved that, and it was moved up through uh, the apple orchard of Sam Kronig's house right up the street here on Center Street and placed onto the pasture land that Bishop Whittemore had had, and that's where our center was redone for worshiping, for activities, and so forth. We felt a great commitment to the um, slowly increasing population of the Jewish faith who came here in the summers. And we, uh, our little community was busy earning a living and um, uh, and we didn't have any paid leadership, but we made up a program through the volunteer aspects to have services every Friday night. We had a very strong lecture series going on, made up of all kinds of people who came. Uh, Pat Putnam to went to the Congo to study the pygmies, the clergy from the other, from the churches came. Abba Eben came, and uh, we had noted rabbinical people, Rabbi Brickner being one of them who was renowned throughout the country, because every Friday night we had a dis very distinguished person. I do want to share with you more than just historical fact, though. What a wonderful, wonderful pleasure it was, and we were so proud we had our own center. And this was a fulfillment of the dreams that this little 
band of six families had when I came to America uh, to be able to have a life here, to be assimilated into a community, and above all, to be the best citizens this country ever had. Mm -hmm.